Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Aditya. On August 26th, uh, the American arms maker Sigsor announced that it had signed a contract to provide an additional 73,000 Sig 716 rifles to the Indian Army. Uh, now, this would actually double the number of Sigsor 716 rifles uh, in service in India. Uh, and it's the latest example of a series of of ad hoc purchases uh, made by the Indian Army. And and really, it's part of a broader pattern of ad hoc small arms procurement in India. And to discuss the weird history of how India has procured small arms for its armed forces, for its police, and what we can do about this, uh, I'm joined, of course, uh, by Satya Sahu. So, Satya, welcome. It's great to be talking small arms with you again. Hi, Didio. Thanks for um, inviting me podcast. All right. So what I want to do, Satya, today is, you know, we've had a previous episode where we uh, discussed, uh, you know, some of the challenges with recent tenders and what can be done. Uh, What I want to do today is to take the opportunity to really go back to the very beginning, to the years before independence and right after independence. And just maybe you can run us through what India's relationship has been to uh, designing, making, importing small arms and what sort of small arms have really been uh, in uh, service in, in in the armed forces uh, as, as well as the police. Uh, let's start with, you know, the old Lee Enfield and a rifle and the Bren machine guns. What happened with them? Yeah, so um, contrary, to, contrary to a lot of, you know, popular beliefs, um, India actually has a rich history of you know, being involved in firearm designing and manufacture. So if we go back to the World War II era, actually before that as well, since the world First World War and before that, um, the British uh, were interested in, in having small arms manufacturing capability and capacity on the, you know, subcontinent because they were waging wars uh, across the subcontinent. They were, um, they needed it for policing. They also had to, you know, uh, leverage it for, you know, fighting the war against, um, the Japanese forces in in Myanmar and and, and Burma at the time, etc., as well as on the Afghanistan front as well. So they were the ones who uh, you know instituted the Ordnance Factory Board that we know now today. Um, and the first um, kind of rifles that came out of it were the, as you mentioned, the Lee Enfield rifles, right? The bolt action rifles that we see very commonly slung across policemen's backs these days. Actually, that is, I mean, I'm I'm kind of remiss when I say that's what we see today. Uh, that's actually post independence the uh, the newly formed indian government they decided to make a copy of the lee enfield which was chambered in a pretty old round at the time the 303 uh, rimfire cartridge chambered it in the 762 by 51 mm nato cartridge which was standardized all across the world right because it was part of nato so they rechambered that particular rifle made a couple of small refinements to the actions etc and that's what we see um, even today and um, I mean, it is also the last bolt-action rifle to be inducted into general service by any army in the world. This was in by 1960, I believe. Um, so it was called the Ishapur 2A1 rifle, Ishapur being the location of the factory where it was made. I mean, so we have a pretty old you know, uh, history in making this. And simultaneously, we also had things like a copy of the British uh, Sterling submachine gun, Colloquially in India, you'd, you'd say, oh, that person is carrying a Sten gun. It was not a Sten gun. It was uh, the Sterling submachine gun that uh, the British Special Forces used for a long time. And it was chambered for a pistol cartridge, right? Um, and that, I think, remains in service still in, in some police services across the country. Uh, but it's very old, right? And by the 1970s, we had decided again to copy the, the British Armed Forces and uh, induct, well, actually reverse engineer a copy of the Belgian FNFAL, right? So, so the British inducted a version of it for their uh, armed forces again in 762 by 51 mm NATO. And what India did, interestingly, was not license the the design from FN, uh, which is a Belgian company. They decided to reverse engineer um, the design completely 
unlicensed um, and made a copy that was not compatible with any other version of the gun elsewhere in the world. So that was the self-loading rifle, the 1A1 SLR. I, I just jump in here and provide a little bit of context. So the FNFAL rifle, as well as another rifle by Hector and Koch, the G3, hmm. were these big battle rifles of Cold War era, right? The early Cold, Cold War era. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk, think about Kalashnikovs being ubiquitous today. But actually, outside of the communist world, it was, of course, the FAL and the G3 that were ubiquitous. For example, India has its own copy of the FAL and Pakistan has its copy of the G3, right? And they all fired the same, uh, you know, 7.62 yeah. into 51 millimeter American cartridge, uh, which became a NATO standard. America really foisted it upon NATO and then other countries, including India and Pakistan, ended up adopting it. Uh, but yes, Satya, so here we are with these SLR rifles. What happens to the bolt action rifles? Uh, usually they just get passed down to paramilitary or police services, right? Um, and I mean, even today we see them in, uh, in uh, you know, rear echelon service across, um, you know, for police constabularies, etc., right? Um, uh, I mean, we, we see them primarily because it's an easy weapon to train on and uh, we have a lot of stockpiles of them left over. So even if we have newer platforms, uh, they're still more expensive to produce even we have something that is, you know, battle tested time tested for so many years also because i mean it's just the sorry state of um i mean storage etc right so we usually see this kind of platforms even the sterling submachine gun right as i mentioned keeps being passed on to police organizations right and what happens next uh so you have fals in service so you have fals which are these full powered battle rifles which are in service uh you know which are effective to maybe 600 meters in theory mm. and you have of the Sterling submachine guns, which fire these stubby little pistol rounds. And our automatic weapons are useful to maybe 100 or 200 meters range at most, right? You're basically supplementing your long range fi firepower with a bit of close range automatic firepower. But, you know, this is, this is, this is, this sort of stands outside the trend of so called intermediate power assault rifles, right? right. Uh, which we saw, you know, starting in. Second World War from Germany, but then also with the Kalashnikov series of rifles. How did India approach uh, this whole business of so-called assault rifles? Right, that's a good question. I think um, conventional doctrine at the time, uh, at the time of the SLR, the, the, the Indian copy of the FL, right, the SLR, uh, being inducted, was still very firmly entrenched in the whole, you know, uh, full power, full size battle rifle cartridge, which is the 7.62 NATO. However, towards the 80s, we realized that. Um, we were, I think, we're engaged in enough counterinsurgency operations, terrorist uh, infractions, etc., that we may need to, you know, rethink our um, doctrinal approach as well. Um, um, I mean, we had used pistol caliber SMGs before, submachine guns before, and let's say the the Operation Blue Star and 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 uh, elsewhere. But by the 80s, the the requirement for having a um, smaller cartridge with you know more ammo capacity per soldier was pretty um, uh, you know prominent. So I think as a stopgap measure by the 90s, India had uh, uh, bought a, a lot of Romanian-made Kalashnikovs, AK-47s, or you know as we would say it. I think most with folding stocks, and these are also what we see a lot um, today. Again, arming a lot of our armed forces as well as paramilitary forces. Um, but by the 80s, we had begun um, thinking about making an indigenous uh, platform, right? The whole idea of a single platform being used in different roles, like you can have a, a assault rifle capable of select fire of, of semi-automatic as well as fully automatic or burst fire. And then you could have a carbine on it with, with a smaller barrel. And uh, then you also have a squad automatic weapon, the you know the quintessential light machine gun kind of thing, where you know you just swap out the upper receiver, add a longer barrel and some other refinements, and with a slightly uh, you know higher capacity magazines, and uh, you can use the you know same platform, achieve economies of scale, be able to streamline your logistics. So the Indian small arm system, the INSAS, was born of this by the late 80s already, and I think the first production models had rolled out by the time the Kargil War had started. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember. I mean, the, in, even during the Kargil War, while the Insas rifles had come into service, it was still early days, right? I, there, there, you would find images of so some soldiers uh, during that conflict carrying Insas rifles. You'd very, you'd very rarely see the LMG, the light machine gun version. Mm -hmm. It was just the rifles. 
Um, and then you'd see the various Kalashnikovs and, and others, you know, so you'd have the Romanian Kalashnikovs, like you mentioned, the East German Kalashnikovs. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd also find this uh, uh, rifle from the erstwhile Czechoslovakia, uh, the VZ-58, which is you know, yeah. not a Kalashnikov, but looks a lot like it and fires the same bullet. And you'd find really at least these four types of rifles in service at the same time. And obviously, this was not sustainable. Everybody in the army also understood it. And yes, we did start seeing the INSAS being adopted in large numbers. But Satya, what exactly happened? Why did the Indian Army give up on it? It's a good question. I don't think uh, giving giving up is, is a very strong word to describe what's happened with it. So first of all, um, I mean, the, the usual teething troubles of any new weapons platform are always going to be there, right? That the American armed forces faced it in Vietnam when they fielded the M16 uh, with the new, you know, 5.56mm uh, NATO intermediate caliber cartridge. And it took them a couple of years to you know, iron out the the training issues, the the quality control issues and, and things that they hadn't thought about when developing, right? So um, when, when Indian troops got their hands on the INSAS, I think during the Kargil War, which was its full first, you know, uh, field uh, deployment, if I'm not wrong, they had a lot of issues where um, the plastic furniture on the inside, the polymer furniture, uh, would crack due to warping in the cold temperatures, right? Um, something that is still inexplicably a problem today, I think, are things like oil splatters from the gun firing. Uh, you know, the oil splatters on the on the operator being a huge problem. And there's very hot oil splatter, right? That, that's something you don't want an operator to go through. Similarly, like um, the fire control group, for instance, having reliability problems where if you're uh, firing on semi-automatic or burst options, the trigger just remains depressed or, you know, it, it fires in full auto, right? Which takes away the idea of control from the operator away from you. So um, these are usually what we would consider teething problems, right? Because, I mean, A, it's, a, it's an indigenous effort. It's going to take time to get to the point where countries with a... Lot more infrastructure in the history of small arms development have gotten to at that point, right? So you'd assume that would be ironed out. Um, it did not get ironed out for a long time. Um, similarly, I think it was also uh, the insult was also exported to countries like Nepal, for instance. Um, and I mean, I don't know the veracity of it. A lot of the insults problems were apparently blamed for why security troops, for instance, were not um, the Nepali security troops were not, um, you know. Uh, uh, great at, at defending against insurgents, for instance, right? And uh, so on and so forth. Similarly, um, I think quality control is a huge problem. And I think it remains so to this day. Uh, aside from that, what ended up happening was uh, there are some offshoots of the INSAS as well. I think uh, by the early 2000s and mid-2000s, uh, we had thought about creating uh, versions of it like the Amok and the Excalibur carbines. Uh, I think... Um, uh, there are also DMR versions of it, I'm, if I'm not wrong. DMR, which is your uh, designated uh, squad, designated marksman rifle, right? And the other problem with INSAS was the design philosophy that it came with did not allow it to be very modular or versatile, right? So it did not allow for a lot of rails that you see today that are essential for mounting accessories like optics and, um, you know, laser sights, um, etc. Or under barrel attachments like grenade launchers. Uh, it it did it did not lend it itself to those functions very well. So, going back to the drawing board was apparently expensive or uh, you know inefficient, and it never saw the light of day. And what ended up happening was by 2008, when the Mumbai terror terror attacks took place, um, and we realized that our security forces, police or you know paramilitary, uh, uh, regardless of that, they were not equipped for it, and we had maybe a substandard platform in our hands. Uh, what ended up happening was. The conversation around procurement of small arms or development shifted to being more ad hoc, uh, more fragmented across state home ministries, union home ministries, um, the, the forces themselves, the specific requirements of, um, you know, the special forces like the NSG, etc. So what ended up happening, you know, what ended up happening is essentially what we see today is that we get a particular, this is the 6716 as a battle rifle. We have something like the AK-203 or the other older AK-47s uh, being pressed into service for, uh, you know, uh, I guess, non, uh, you know, frontline fighters, etc. Yeah. And then you have, uh, you know, other others just trying to fill in the gaps, right? So that's a huge logistical nightmare. But I wouldn't say they've given up on the INSAS so far. I think they have, uh, I think there are efforts uh, underway to modernize it, um, get some contractors to come 
uh, upgrade the furniture etc equip equip it with rails etc uh, i don't know what the uh, whether there has been any outcomes on that front or not but yeah so far that's to my knowledge that's what's happened yeah this is uh, i mean the insas is is a fascinating and also disappointing saga right like you said uh, satya you know a lot of what we hear about the insas sounds like the typical teething problems that you know the m16 had that even the kalashnikovs had right mm. so the first kalashnikovs that came out in 1947 had basic production problems problems with durability and it was only by about 1958 1959 that you know they figured figured this out and that's a so called akm that we mm. we know of which most people think are ak47s and like with the m16 like you mentioned during vietnam there were problems with uh, with uh, ammunition there were problems with lubricants they fixed all this and then eventually in the early 80s they adopted a new nato cartridge you know uh, so, so there's a lot of changes and iterations that these rifles have gone through over over some time but i think that besides <clears throat> these teething problems there were a couple of other things going on one um, is that you know it's really important for the end users to have confidence in the rifle and i think that was lacking partly because of these teething problems but also partly because of this impression that the 5.56 into 45 nato round yeah. was not lethal uh, uh, and uh, you know this i'm not sure that how accurate this was some of this alleged lack of lethality may also have to do with the specific indian manufacture indian variant of the round uh, mm. uh, but a, a lot of folks in the army especially those involved in counter insurgency were really sold on the russian uh, kalashnikov round uh and uh, so we start seeing of course more kalashnikovs being bought again this time from bulgaria and other countries uh and uh you also have uh, you know the government factory in trichy for example making the so called trichy assault rifle which is really yeah. a kalashnikov mostly for para- paramilitary forces you have some weird uh, uh general staff qualitative requirements put out mm. in 2011 for you know a rifle that can switch calibers and things like that all of course all of this doesn't really work out um but uh i i think the other f- issue with the insas was simply that uh you know i i there i think there's a sense that it was simply wasn't as advanced as other offerings from from abroad right so it was a bit heavier like you mentioned it was not as modular or adaptable to uh to optics and other accessories uh so you know i think for all of those reasons they did want to go back to the to the drawing board uh but what has happened really since they've gone back to the drawing board why why for example are we still making ad hoc purchases of uh, 6716 rifles also your uh, impression of why india has moved back to the old slr route hmm. so um so, so part of it I'll, i'll answer the second question first part of it is i think there's an overwhelming sentiment on the part of the armed forces the users of the rifles that um, you know the intermediate caliber 556 nato uh, cartridge is just not lethal enough right you know it's not a um, colloquially speaking one shot one kill kind of round except there also seems to be a, a sentiment that the 762 by 39 mm ak47 cartridge the the m43 cartridge that is a lot more lethal now that also is an intermediate caliber cartridge right um, uh, it ha- it is a heavier round it's a, it's a slower round but then we go and end up purchasing you know the 762 by 51 mm nato round which is much larger cartridge much more powerful uh, i think almost twice the kinetic energy of the 556 uh, nato round um, which is you know is not not the same thing as the kalashnikov round at all so i think part of it is obviously because of an ad hoc procurement system you know the emergency procurement you end up uh, you know going on the basis of, basis of this sentiments um and i guess uh, your requirements to you know to, to quickly equip troops on the front line etc and then we end up you know buying the 6716 which is not a bad rifle by any any means right it just doesn't have scientifically conducted trials field studies uh, forming the basis of this purchase right and we see this happening across multiple fronts and uh, i mean this also means that uh, we end up you know fielding tenders that are really large etc when development so in doing development to be clear not procurement when we decide on the development of a small arm platform that can fulfill all this you know very wide ranging requirements what ends up happening is you 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 try and make it for a for the entire armed forces which ends up being a very large amount um you know in in us dollars right so you end up having a lot of competitors from foreign companies to i think recently domestic companies as well as well as you know the ofb the ordnance factory board which very recently had the sole monopoly of 
um, you know, on making small arms in India. So you have DRDO, you have the ARD all, and the Army Design Bureau all involved in the um, development of the small arms. Um, except what ends up happening is because you have such a wide-ranging, very granular requirements for some reason. Um, and uh, we have recently come to know that, you know, a lot of the requirements, for instance, on ammunition specifies the exact kind of brass type you use for the cartridge shell, right? Um, not sure why that is exactly something that is needed to be specified in the in the in the in the RFP, etc. Because at the end of the day, if you have field trials from all the competitors that come and offer you their ammunition, uh, you're going to figure out whether something matches to the quality or not. There is no real reason to be that granular, right? Uh, but the problem with being that granular is you create a lot of problems in terms of bureaucratic uh, check marks while you are um, you know overseeing the the development of this ammunition, and that just leads to delays and uh, further revisions and then you end up not seeing any progress happen for a lot of years and then when the the requirement for equipping military becomes paramount you end up you know going down the emergency procurement route which is fine but we have seen this happen over and over again for i think for the better part of like 10 15 years now so um, and that's that's a problem yeah, and from what I understand, there's both an emergency procurement and a fast-track procurement route. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, either way, the, the impact is the same, right? We have haphazard uh, adoption uh, of, of weapons. Uh, what are some potential solutions for this? I mean, how uh, one thing that would is, seems obvious is that you decide what calibers you want, right? I mean, right now we're using two intermediate calibers and one mm -hmm. full-power caliber, as well as a multiple rifles for each of these calibers. Mm -hmm. So... What is the solution? Do, do we should we first rationalize just what calibers we plan to use? Yeah, so um, just to give a broad idea, we right now have for our frontline as well as you know just main battle service, we have the AK203, which is a project with the Russian companies, the Rosoboron Export and Kalashnikov of Concern, with the OFB Ordnance Factory Board being the other um, Indian partner, right? So they have a factory in Amethi and they are making the rifles. I'm not sure if they're making or assembling as of now. I don't know the extent of the localization that has happened. Uh, and I'd be very doubtful about, you know, if the localization was anywhere beyond 25%. And it's also pretty delayed, right? Um, and we still don't know whether Russia will remain the the exporter of, of um, concern when uh, spare parts, etc., or ammunition is concerned, right? Um, uh, and we don't know the Russia's capacity to, to fulfill those orders as well, because it's currently embroiled in a war. The second thing is, as you mentioned, the 6716 rifles. I think we have around 140,000 of those um, after the latest tranche of... So by, by next year, we'll have about 140,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, we don't know if India has bought... Uh, I mean, the main cell, the USP of the 6716 rifle or any armor light platform, right, uh, is that it's modular, it's versatile, it can take on a lot of accessories that are essential um, for any kind of situation you need, right? So... Um, supposedly, these this are going to be fielded in the by troops um, on our on the hilly um, regions, I assume the mountainous areas, and for which you would require optics and and a lot of other um, systems, right? Um, I don't know if we have purchased those or we are buying those from other sources to you know supplement this, right? Um, those are the two things, and the two cartridges are wildly different: seven six two by thirty nine and seven six two by uh, fifty one. Um, there are still, I think. Efforts underway to to modernize the insas or or refit it or upgrade it for continued service. So that means the five five six by forty five mm NATO round is also not going out of service anytime soon. So we have these are the three main cartridges that you know that's already um, you know very difficult for logistics to handle, right? Um, and on top of that, you have maybe um, you know pistol caliber rounds for SMGs etc. Uh, SMGs being submachine guns, submachine like guns, the Sterling. yeah, yeah. Um, or pistols. I don't think pistols really actually are, you know, filtered in, in the front lines anyway. Uh, but yeah, so these are, on a broad level, these are the things. So when you uh, convolute logistics this way, you now have issues of training because you can't really transfer the same kind of training you have on an AR platform to the AK. Um, you have ammo quality control. That's something that's uh, been a problem so far with, with I think, OFB produced ammo. I don't know if they've solved it so far or not. Um, you can't interchange magazines because remember we talked about weapons as a platform service before. So you have the same light machine gun based on a similar platform that can now can now cannot be you know used with ammunitions or magazines of a different kind of platform. So if you have, uh, I think we're still using the FN Mag 
and and uh, the insas lmg i think still yes, on the way they they both in use uh, yeah. so and the, the thing is if a, a section um, an army section uh, has six, six seven on six rifles and is filling with the fn mag or the uh, insas lmg first of all insas lmg fires 556 by 45 so it's completely incompatible which means it's difficult to clarify logistics within the section level yeah. let alone the battalion it, it, level. it also means that uh, in a section your uh, people with rifles are firing a more powerful cartridge than yeah, the person with a light machine yeah. gun yeah so suppressive uh, the questions of doctrine also around yeah. arise right if you someone is firing the fn mag for instance which is a thing um, a more sustained firing option um, you while you, you still share the same cartridge you don't share the same magazine that can be just quickly you know immediately be attached to it which was the entire idea for weapon as a platform the insas lmg could use the same magazines as the insas rifle was using carbine or the sort of was using uh it becomes even more difficult if someone is equipped with the ak because now you can't even share the cartridge between two platforms right um it becomes more complicated when the squad designated marksman comes into the picture right so so you have all of these issues coming up maintenance and deployment just becomes a very difficult thing to take care of um so the recommendation wise you know first of all of course you know just just have field trials before procurement goes on it right? this is assuming we're not developing our own platform um just just make sure that whatever you're procuring do it after proper well thought out trials this have been ha- this have been happening for like i think 60 70 years now we can use a template used by the us uh, elsewhere as well right uh, but just know what we're doing um secondly i think uh, and this is an interesting thing is that if we want to give a philip to our indigenous uh, you know uh, small arms manufacturing startup ecosystem we need to be able to let go of the granularity requirements you know granular requirements in our tenders and rfps that we provide because at the end of the day you just want to be assured that okay whatever you're getting is of a particular quality standard that you want and it can perform in the battlefield right uh, we don't care about how it's going to be made at the end of the day so figuring out what the brass type is what alloy it specifically is um um etc you know and also just you know again it goes back to the whole trials and field studies thing is that you enable them to have a level playing field with um stalwarts defense you know like six or for instance right um foreign companies so that is the other thing and finally i think um if you go down the emergency procurement route or fast track procurement route um do it in batches small batches you can have the same cartridge you can have the same Uh, you know broad platform ar or ak or something and then ask uh, companies to you know uh, like like buy, to you know to provide let's say 50000 rifles in a batch and then test for those so you have smaller uh, pu- smaller amounts of public money being funneled into it you have somewhat some compatibility with the existing platforms that we still have and because the total tender amount is low that means you have good competition among startups etc who can who can, whose scale allows them to meet this demand like they can't obviously meet the demand of like you know let's say 1 million rifles or like 500000 rifles right but 50000 100000 is it's fine over course of 2 3 years um, so yeah that's it from my end there's a lot of other things i could talk about but I'll stop it here. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, Satya. We could go on for with this forever, but I, I think that uh, that we have three broad recommendations that we can take away. One is, of course, we need to rationalize the number of calibers. Uh, mm. So you know, go down from three to two. I, that that makes a lot of sense. Two is we should prioritize uh, families of weapon systems because that eases uh, logistics, training, everything. Right. Uh, th- third is is a bit at odds with the second one, which is that. maybe we should do small incremental purchases mm. but i think that is i think that's a small uh time horizon type of thing which we should aim to do over the next 5 to 10 years to basically help uh at uh, both the army understand what exactly its requirements are and also perhaps uh you know seed the beginnings of a real small arms ecosystem in india right so we might have to do that for a while so that before we can standardize on something uh small arms are an evolutionary rather than rev- revolutionary type of technology so most likely we're not going to see some massive disruption in the coming decades so it, you know it's important to start getting the technology and the know-how in place today so that we are in a better place 10 years from now we have better options and we can finally start adopting preferably indian made and indian designed uh, families of weapon systems uh, all right uh, thanks satya it's great to once again talk about uh, the weapons of india's infantry uh, and uh, Yeah, I mean we're really tempted to come back with another episode at some point so we probably will. Uh thank you for listening to us. 
If you liked our show, dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs. Check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.